Good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to Navigating Our World this evening. Before I pass things off to Minister Joni's Austin, can we just praise God for what happened yesterday for the election of Pastor Warnock as our new, uh, no, our renewed U.S. Senator from Georgia, another six years. So we are just thrilled. Um, we will probably have some kind of celebration after church on Sunday. Um, but just join me in praising God for what God has done in this season. So we're excited about this and um, looking forward to this next chapter. And may I say, I am glad yesterday is over. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> So, Joni, if I can kick it to you to lead us through this evening. Yes, so welcome everyone to now. Um, this week we are continuing in our Howard Thurman series. Um, now is a fellowship and ministry providing opportunities for individual growth, social transformation, knowledge, and skills to navigate our world. So we've just had our musical selection, The Work of Christmas, which is a Howard Thurman piece. Um, we're having our opening now. Um, next, we'll have our intercessory prayer by Deaconess Katrina Acock. We will have a theological reflection, um, a video um, message from Reverend Dr. Otis Master III on Howard Thurman, and then we will go into our breakout group. So we'll have some time to read some meditations by Howard Thurman and really just 
reflect um, in community about what this season means for us. Um, with that, I will pass it off to Deaconess Acock. Good evening. I'm Deaconess Katrina Acock, and I will be leading us in our intercessory prayer. If there are any prayer requests, please feel free to unmute and share them or put them in the chat. I would like to begin by sharing a poem from Dr. Howard Thurman's book, The Mood of Christmas and Other Celebrations. It says, this is the season of promise. Let the bells be silenced. Let the gifts be stillborn. Let cheer be muted. Let music be soundless. Violence stalks the land. Soaring above the cry of the dying, rising above the whimper of the starving, floating above the flying machines of death. Listen to the long stillness. New life is stirring. New dreams are on the wing. New hopes are being ready. Mankind is fashioning a new heart. Mankind is forging a new mind. God is at work. This is the season of promise. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, the lover of our souls, we come giving you thanks for being the God who hears us when we come to you according to your will. Asking and knowing that we have what we have asked for, we give you praise. In these times of uncertainty, we come humbly to your throne of grace and mercy, knowing that you hear us, you see us, and you have your hands on us, dear Lord. You have it all in control. We give you praise. We pray for this time of teaching, reflection, and prayer through the technology that you have given us within the now ministry, navigating our world. We pray for our presenter this evening, Dr. Otis Moss III. And we thank you for all that will be shared with from him. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who have joined us this evening. Open our hearts and minds to receive the insights that are being presented. We pray for our bereaved families here at Ebenezer and our larger community all over this world. We pray healing and restoration for the sick and strength and comfort for those who are caring for them. We lift up prayers for all requests that were voiced aloud and in the chat this evening. We pray especially for, for our pastor, Reverend Raphael Warnock, and the victory you, have get, you, have, you gave him through the vote of your people. Strengthen him as he goes through the next six years in the Senate and in the pulpit here at Ebenezer. Renew, restore, revive him. Keep him safe from all hurt, harm, and danger. We thank you, Lord. We praise you and we love you. For it is in your son Jesus' name, the Christ, I pray. Amen. 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 I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. To the Ebenezer family, I want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share this conversation about one of the greatest theologians, spiritual thinkers, mystics, and philosophers, the person we know as Howard Thurman. I want to thank your pastor, my friend and classmate, and none other than Pastor Dr. Senator Raphael Warnock. We thank you for your witness and your work and your creativity and the manner in which you are holding up the banner not only the banner for Morehouse College for the state of Georgia, but the banner that has been laid and set by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The way that you are able to hold uh, the ideas of liberation in one hand and also uh, the ideas of transformation in the other. Thank you so very much 
my brother, for the work uh, that you are doing, and to the entire Ebenezer team and family, uh, my brother John Vaughn, we thank you for uh, your work and your witness. There is a show that used to come on TV One entitled Unsung. They would always share in the intro, untold, unsung, and then they would give you the information about a particular artist who is incredibly influential, but not enough people know about that artist's influence. I believe that Howard Thurman fits within the area of what we would say is unsung. And so what we want to do today is I want to share with you a documentary that we have created, I should say, really a lecture, where we want to talk about the untold, uh, the unsung, uh, the blessed person in the name uh, whose name is Howard Thurman, the most influential spiritual voice and philosophical thinker America has forgotten, the roots and the power of this unsung hero. Born in 1899 in Daytona Beach, it is in his birth that we see a glimmer of the spiritual genius of this man. One of the great stories that I love in his, his memoir with head and heart, it is dedicated to a gentleman at the railroad track who changed his life. Howard Thurman, as a young boy, was preparing to go to, I believe it was Florida Academy, which is an all-black school, since schools were segregated during that time period. He brought all of his clothes in a trunk, and that trunk had been tied with a rope. The ticket holder, or I should say uh, the ticket master, who was pr providing tickets for those who came to the railroad station, decided to hold Howard Thurman, young Howard Thurman, up on a technicality. He looked at his trunk and said, there's a requirement that every trunk has to have a an handle, and yours does not. You have to purchase another trunk, otherwise you're not going to be able to travel on this train. Howard Thurman, uh, beaten by these words, saw his entire future disappear at that moment. When a person appeared behind him, and as he writes about it, talks about this man seemed to appear as an angel, and said to Howard Thurman, this young man, he said, are you just simply going to hang your head? And when he heard that Howard Thurman wanted to go to school, this, young, this gentleman paid for his ticket and paid for uh, the proper the proper trunk so that he could make his way to the Florida Academy. He said that he turned one way as he was preparing to board the train and then turned back and the man who had helped him had disappeared. He never found the man's name, but he changed his life and trajectory. Why is this story important? Because one of the things that Howard Thurman is attempting to do is he's attempting to mine the experience, that word right there, experience. For Howard Thurman, experience through story, experience in story, and experience that you have and articulate as a story connects us to God or connects us to the sacred. Over and over in the works of Howard Thurman, he does not share in an academic sense by quoting other people and giving footnotes. He shares story in order for us to get a glimpse of the divine. Let me give you one prime example. In one of his meditations, he talks about the fact that there's, there are certain types of water. There are rivers, there are swamps, there are reservoirs. He says rivers are constantly flowing. They have inlet and outlet, and they're constantly moving and being refreshed. There are reservoirs of waters that collect 
and eventually have an outlet, but are usually collected in order for a, for a purpose, whether that purpose is to drink, whether that purpose is to be utilized, for example, to put out a fire. And then there is a swamp. He says that's water that comes into an area but has no outlet. It collects. And as a result of that, things begin to die when there is no outlet. In other words, when you collect, but you do not allow things to be released, it creates a situation where things become swampy and they die. Thurman's primary question was this, are you a river, are you a reservoir, or are you a swamp? He goes on a little bit deeper to say that depending upon where we are in life, there are moments where we operate like a swamp, where we collect and we collect and we collect, and then we raise the question, why are things dying around us? Then there are moments when we become a reservoir where we collect, but we are not collecting for ourselves. We are collecting eventually to serve someone else. Then there are times when we flow like a river where we are moving and constantly being refreshed, where the water is being renewed, refreshed, and we are literally flowing into something larger, a bay or an ocean. He goes on to say, be careful about being a swamp. There are moments when we need to be a reservoir and we hopefully will be a river that will flow into something larger than us. Here he gives a story from nature, using experience and the story to give us a glimpse of the divine. He's borrowing from the African tradition, better known as the griot. The griot was the storyteller. And through telling of story, one would get a glimpse of divine wisdom. Thurman is from the South, the grand space of storytelling. One cannot live in the South and not know a good storyteller. Oh, there are storytellers across the country, but the South has a unique tradition of storytelling. So Thurman takes this storytelling tradition and then the observation of nature and allows the reader and the hearer, whether one is hearing him preach, or reading to get a glimpse of God. And this is what academics would call mysticism. It is not through memorization. It is not through doctrine that one connects with God, but through experience. So the Southern storytelling tradition is important for Thurman in order for one to understand what cannot be placed within the human vocabulary, story, metaphor, images, simile, symbols, and rituals become important for us to connect with God. Thurman was raised in Daytona Beach, Florida, went on to Florida Academy, and then entered a wonderful school in Atlanta, Georgia, known as Morehouse College. He was under the tutelage of a person by the name of John Hope. John Hope, who was the first African-American president of Morehouse, and was part of what was known as part of the, the black social gospel tradition. Gary Dorn, professor at Union Theological Seminary, has written extensively on the black theological tradition, the black social justice or social gospel tradition. And it's Gary Dorn who is saying that we should not frame black theology and black spirituality 
as simply white spirituality in blackface. But there is a tradition that people of African descent bring to the table. John Hope was one of the articulators of this tradition. Interestingly enough, along with W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells, and many others who drew from the works of Frederick Douglass, Benjamin Banneker, Benjamin Banneker, Sojourner Truth, and Harriet Tubman, Marion Wright Stewart, and others who were articulating a gospel that was not just Western in its framing, but reached down into the well of black religiosity. John Hope was one of the early supporters of the NAACP and the National Urban League and was preaching and teaching the idea that in order for one to truly be a follower of Christ, one must embody the work of Christ, not just through what you articulate with your tongue, but what you articulate with your body, meaning liberation for your community, ensuring that suffering is alleviated by those who are marginalized. He is hearing this in the 1920s. He then graduates in 1923 and then begins to teach. <coughs> Moves on to Rochester uh, Theological Seminary. And in 1936, he makes a trip to India. <coughs> this trip to India would be transformative for Howard Thurman. While he is in India, he has an encounter uh, with a Hindu brother who raises a question about him being a traitor, a traitor to his people, a traitor to his race, a traitor to the darker peoples of the world. This Hindu brother was saying, here you are in India, you are a black American, Negro to be exact is the words that was used back then. And you are an articulator of the faith of your oppressor. Across the globe, people who primarily oppress have two uh, particular traits. They are white and they are Christian. How could you be a part of their faith tradition? This put Howard Thurman on the path of articulating what he had known intrinsically and organically, but had not been fully put on paper, that the faith tradition of people of African descent is not just Christianity in a white face, Christianity in black face. The tradition is a tradition that is connected to West Africa. The tradition is connected to Southern storytelling. The tradition is passed on from the ancestors. The tradition views God very differently and interprets scripture and connects with an African tradition that is older than any Western Christian tradition. That African traditions connected to Christianity are the oldest on the planet. So he goes on this journey to articulate what it means for people who have their backs against the wall to serve Jesus Christ. And as a result, in the 1940s, a book is produced that literally transforms the theological landscape entitled Jesus and the Disinherited. In this book, he shares the idea, what does Jesus have to say to those who have their backs against the wall, to the oppressed? 
And in this book, he does something so beautiful and powerful as he begins to share an interpretation of Jesus that is counter the conservative ev evangelical interpretation that has been witnessed across the United States. That Jesus was a Jew, a part of a minority group. That Jesus was part of a colonized community, a community that was dealing with occupation. Jesus was a part of a community that was despised by those who were in power. As a result of being a part of this minority group, as a result of being a part of a colonized community and being poor, Jesus is on the side of those who are oppressed and has a message for those in the world who are minorities, who have been colonized, who have been poor, and who have been despised. He frames in Jesus and the disinherited what I would call the black theological tradition or the black spiritual tradition that we in America designed from the moment that we land landed in this country in 1619. Our practice of the faith is not the same practice that you have in the mainline traditions. We view God and view Jesus very differently. Jesus knows all about our troubles. Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go on to be with my Lord. I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. Uh, through the spirituals, through the storytelling, through the art, we were articulating a different theology. And Howard Thurman placed on paper what had been shared from generation to generation. Now what must be known about Jesus and the disinherited and the interpretation that Howard Thurman takes of Jesus is this simple idea what should be known is that Howard Thurman was one of the first people to privilege womanist interpretation and frame that across the nation especially for men who had always privileged the voices of men. What, what are you talking about? Well, in Jesus and the Disinherited. Instead of pulling Martin Luther as his source of understanding scripture, his grandmother is his source. His grandmother, who was an enslaved African, who clearly stated that there are some things in the Bible I have issue with, especially Paul, who said slaves be obedient to their masters. Thurman was privileging his grandmother and sharing hermeneutics, how to interpret by privileging his grandmother. And Jesus and the disinherited becomes a staple upon the plate of individuals who were involved in the freedom movement. L let me just give you some of the people who were influenced by Jesus and the disinherited. This is just a small list. Joanne Robinson, the woman who was the architect for the Montgomery Improvement Association and the Women's Political Council. Diane Nash of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Septima Clark, 
who was the organizer of freedom schools, teaching young people how to register to vote and giving civic education in the South. Fannie Lou Hamer, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Reverend Hosea Williams, Reverend James Orange, William Holmes Borders, Reverend Andrew Young, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, Bob Moses, Otis Moss Jr., and of course, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That's just a small list of people who've been influenced by Jesus and the disinherited, and specifically have been influenced by Howard Thurman. He is truly our unsung hero. It is Reverend Andrew Young who states that Dr. King carried three books with him wherever he traveled. He had a copy of the Constitution, he had a copy of the Bible, and he had a copy of Jesus and the Disinherited. Our understanding of nonviolence, the Kingian framework of nonviolence, was influenced by Bayard Rustin and the work of Howard Thurman. When Howard Thurman made that trip in 1936 to India, he not only encountered a Hindu brother who challenged him about articulating his faith appropriately, but he also had an encounter with Mohandas Gandhi. And as they had communication together, Gandhi shared with him an ancient concept known as ahimsa, a 2,000 year old tradition meaning the sacredness of life, all life, wherever that life may be, whether that life is a cow or that life is a human being, to ensure in the protection of life that every living being has the divine, has the imprint of the divine upon it. In those conversations, Thurman said, within my tradition, there is, there is a concept. We call it agape, the love that God has for God's people, that every human being is the imagio Dei, in the image of God. And it is through this conversation that then Thurman moved to one of his life's working papers. This idea, this life working paper, was the belief that followers of the religion of Jesus, those who are willing to exercise the limit of power and moral suasion upon men in the interest of redemption of themselves and society. He believed that agape, ahimsa, that e each religious tradition demands that we seek to protect the divine imprint upon individuals. And it is through nonviolence, not just the tactic, but the lifestyle. I like the way that my father says it when he speaks about nonviolence. He said that nonviolence cannot stop murder, but it can keep you from being a murderer. When it is a lifestyle, we recognize the divine imprint upon each and every human being. And so his life's working paper was culminated in a book entitled The Search for Common Ground. He believed that each spiritual tradition has a form of agape, ahimsa, has a form of love, the alleviation of suffering, of the recognition that each person has the imprint of the divine upon them. And it is our duty to embody this agape, embody this ahimsa, to embody this operation and living so that all human beings, to borrow from the Stoic tradition, 
can live the good life, can flourish and live out to their full capacity. And Thurman would bristle when those who thought themselves radical would say that you need to have a liberation philosophy that focuses upon the economic, the material. And Thurman would respond and say this, there are limits to material liberation. Because if you are liberated materially, economically, the soul is anemic, it means nothing. The soul must be liberated in concert with your surroundings. To neglect the soul means that you will end up repeating, if I may borrow from Audre Lord, that you will attempt to build or tear down the master's house with the master's tools and build a new house with the master's tools, a house that will just have different colors and some different wallpaper, but will oppress the same people in a different way. Thurman focused on the soul, not to the exclusion of what is happening on the sociological level, but his belief is there has to be an internal revolution in order for there to be an external revolution. They go hand in hand. And this was challenging for some of the thinkers of the day, whether it was a Stokely Carmichael or a Fred Hampton or a Huey P. Newton. But it was challenging in a good way to say that you can have liberation, but if your soul is damaged, has liberation actually taken place? And this was the project for Thurman, where he was attempting to go inward. He was becoming a mystic. He was believing that there was a common ground and that the language that we use in reference to our spirituality is always behind where the spirit truly is. Whether it is the term that you use Trinity or the uh, term of Buddha or whatever term may be in your tradition, may it's the term of the Torah, that those words still are inadequate and it is experience, experience, the experience with the spirit. Let me see if I can explain this idea of what Thurman was attempting to talk about as a mystic about the experience of the spirit. Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, uh, my predecessor at Trinity, tells this wonderful story of a person uh, who was a janitor at the University of Chicago who was listening in to a lecture of an atheist. The atheist was sharing that God is dead, that there is no God, and was giving all of the proofs of why there is no God that I, I can't touch and feel. And he went on and on and on about why there is no God. The man finished the lecture and the janitor then stopped the professor and said, Professor, you, you, you gave a great lecture. You talked about how there is no God. And, and as he is talking to the professor, he is eating this apple, just eating this apple away, just, just full of, of apples in his mouth. And he's just chewing, just chewing away. And he said, Professor, you, you talked about that there was no God. And he finally finished the apple, and then he threw it away. He said, Professor, you said there was no God, but let me ask you one question, see if you can answer this. Can you tell me if the apple I just ate was sweet or sour? And the professor said, of course I can't, because I haven't tasted it. And the man said, yes, and you haven't tasted my Jesus. And that's what Thurman was saying, that there's an experience that we have, an experience and an encounter that we have with God. And they don't happen every week. According to Thurman, it may happen once or twice in your lifetime, but it reorients your life forever. And you will spend the rest of your life 
trying to unpack that encounter you had with God. The experience. As he says, as he was coming to the close of his life, he was saying that religious experience is filled with vitality. It's yeasty. It's constantly moving and developing. And the words that we have, the doctrines that we create, are always behind. They're a little slow in terms of where the spirit and where God is functioning. This is the power of this unsung, untold prophet. Probably the most influential theologian of the 20th century. Now, I know many seminarians, they know James Cone, but they're is no James Cone unless there is a Howard Thurman. I know we love to talk about Dr. King, but, but there really is no articulation of where do we go from here, chaos or community, unless there is a Howard Thurman. If we talk about a William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign, there is no Poor People's Campaign unless we talk about Howard Thurman. There is no Operation Push, Jesse Jackson, unless we talk about Howard Thurman. There is no push for Jackson to run in 84 and 88 unless we talk about Howard Thurman. Thurman is our unsung hero. And I thank you for this time to be able to share about this brilliant, amazing, spiritual voice who was a theologian, who was a mystic, a philosopher, and an articulator of the black religious tradition in a beautiful way. He does not footnote and reference people from Europe. He tells stories from nature and encounters that he's had with other people across the world. He is the griot of the spirit. And I would encourage you to pick up a Thurman book, whether it is Jesus and the Disinherited, Meditations of the Heart, The Disciplines of the Spirit, his autobiography with Head and Heart, or some of the scholars who have written about Thurman, a beautiful biography against the hounds of hell that has been put out recently, great biography on, on Howard Thurman, or some of the work of Walter Fluker and Dean Lawrence Edward Carter at Morehouse College. Amazing scholarly work about this amazing man. Thank you for giving me time today to talk about my favorite theologian and what every Morehouse man learned at Morehouse. We were told and given this quote by Thurman that I believe every person of faith should know. God places a crown above our heads we will spend the rest of our lives growing tall enough to wear. Hopefully tomorrow you will be taller, but you still won't be tall enough to wear the crown. And when we meet again, I hope we will all be taller, but we still won't be tall enough to wear the crown. But thank God that we're stretching and growing taller every day. God bless you. Amen. Amen. We are so grateful for Dr. Otis Moss III um, and his wonderful information and reflections on Dr. Howard Thurman. 
Um, we're so grateful that you were here to have heard that. And we're going to go a little bit deeper. I know that um, some of you all are, are um, <laughs> our regulars here, and some of you all came because you knew that Dr. Moss was gonna be here, but I invite you to stay because at this time, we're going to be going into breakout groups and we are going to engage some of the writings of Howard Thurman. There are um, three writings, and you might have seen them in the um, announcement that went out today. And also, uh, Minister Austin placed them in the chat. But we'll also be sharing our screens and sharing them with you. And so we'll be reading three very, very short uh, Howard Thurman uh, but yet meaningful and uh, deep meditations. and. Um, working in, and talking about them in um, our small groups. And so if you would um, give me just a second to open our groups, I hope that again, each of you all will stay to engage deeper and to go deeper right now into Howard Thurman. You don't have to wait until tomorrow to purchase a book if you don't have it. You can engage in some of his writing right as we speak. So give me one second. Um, yes, I'm going to open them now. If you, you should see an invitation to join a um, particular meeting room. If you need help getting into your meeting room, just hold on one second and I'm, I'm happy to help you to get into your meeting room. All right. Marin. Yes, I'm here. You're still there? Okay, there's some people who looks who look like they have not joined yet, but I need to go ahead and join my group. So mm -hmm. um I don't know if they're what they're doing. So I'm gonna go to group room five, all right? Okay, okay.
Hey, Miss Judy. Oh, they got closed captioning on here. That's great. Oh, I said, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful face. <laughs> Everyone yeah. else should be coming back in. Okay. So where was the watch party? Uh, uh, Mark, uh, Marriott Marquis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was something else, I tell you. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. That's oh. a nail biter. We were mad at Georgia. Can I tell you? Mm. I've been there post so many times. They went, how many times you going to vote? I said, I'm just bringing more people up here. That's it. That's it. Every I was day. dragging people up there. I was driving people up there. I had to get on my, my kids, my grandchildren. I, I'm like, are you kidding? I mean, I, my, my daughter and I got into it. Yeah. You know, she's trying to say what somebody had done for her. I'm like, what have you done right. for yourself? All oh, right. It looks you. like we're all back. And thank okay. you so much. Um <laughs> for participating in tonight's. I want to just get, I know we're running a little bit late, but, and I hope that you were able to engage the tech a little bit um, and get some good conversation in. And if not, you know that you have access to them and I will actually send the, the questions as well. Johnny, can you put the link to the questions in the chat or the discussion questions? That'd be great. Um, if you want to talk about them some more around your table. Um, but I do want to, take a couple of uh, folks to kind of say how you experienced um, the conversation. Um, how did reading Thurman aloud or hearing uh, Thurman read aloud, how that um, impacted your understanding of him that we've kind of maybe have gained over the last couple of weeks and through, we gained through um, Dr. Moss. Anybody want to give any aha moments, insights? Was there a particular piece that stood out to you that you, we read? Catherine, did we all read the same pieces? We did. We all had the same things. Mm -hmm. um, I will speak on behalf of something that I experienced, and it was the piece called Man Cannot Be Indifferent to Men or to Women, in that certainly I've heard about Howard Thurman for so many years uh, coming out of the HBCU experience at Spelman College and our brothers at Morehouse often, as well as many theologians do quote him. I like that Dr. Thurman talked to us about the importance of community, being connected to one another and why mm -hmm. that's important. And for me at Ebenezer, I can relate to that because I'm feeling a need to connect in a space that has been so familiar for you know, 25 plus years. I miss being there at a certain time in a certain place and, and the readjustment of how we engage, whether it's nine o'clock service or just 11 o'clock service if it ever comes back. So Howard Thurman's statement of why community is important or reconciling, reconciliation is important, restoration. If you've got a broken relationship, fix it because community is how we live. It's how we live and it's how we stay alive. So that's I, my episode. I really um, love that metaphor. I, I wish I could listen to it again about the swamp, the reservoir, and the river. I thought that was extremely powerful about how you engage, right? Are you just collecting things or are you allowing things to flow out, right, and benefit other people? Or are you in some ways becoming a swamp? So that to me was, I mean, I loved his, I love his use of nature, right? Because mm -hmm. um, nature tells us a lot of the lessons we need in life, but that river, swamp, reservoir analogy, extremely powerful to me. Thank you. Anyone else? Any thoughts? I like the comment that Thurman made, ultimately made when he was asked, he said that he was being, by, by using the oppressor's religion, that this was, he was being a traitor. And that from that conversation came his idea or his expressing that it is our African experience. It is uh, from our 
enslavement, our, our former understanding of religion and God, that we bring our theology. It's a different experience. It is not that we are, as he said, we're not putting a black face on white theology. And I thought that was a very important uh, point because there are people who will say, well, why as an enslaved person did we take up the religion of the oppressor? But we really did not. We created something new, something different and pulled from our African experience and our ancestry. So I thought that was uh, for, for Moss to make that point, to have that understanding of what Thurman was really doing uh, was very significant. Thank you. Ms. Poet, do you realize that you're sharing your screen? Okay, thank you. Um, oh, I didn't, thank you. Oh yeah, it's okay. okay. That's all right. Is um, is there anyone else who wants to make a comment? And I'm sorry, I did want to say this one other thing. I did put it in the chat, but I love that quote from Saint Augustine that our souls are God. God makes him, us for God's self, and our souls are restless until we find our rest in God. And I put that, translated that into the river thing that we are like rivers that are flowing and we're flowing and wandering until we find our place with the big sea of God. And I, that was just so touching to me. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, and I love the fact that he put it in this piece that talked, we talked about in our group of these very mundane things that could bring us joy and how those small things, the small things that bring us joy also create, they create connections with others, but they also helped us to help us connect with God. Um, I, I thought that's, I think that's very profound, so. My phrase for tonight, but community is the native climate of the human spirit. Mm. Love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Community is the native climate of the human spirit. Ah, that'll preach. Yeah, oh, we'll hear, so we're gonna hear that in the sermon, huh? You may hear that one in the sermon. <laughs> yes, yes, good, good, good. All right. Any, well, anyone else? We'll take maybe two more comments. Or... Can I ask a quick question? Is yes, the um the the stream of, of Reverend Moss, is that going to be made available? Is there a link somewhere where we can see it again? Yes, so this is live streamed on YouTube. So it was being streamed oh. on YouTube. So if you go back, if you go to Ebenezer's YouTube channel, you can find it and you can watch it again. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think okay. we did stop the streaming, I'd be, you know, once we went into the great breakout groups, but mm -hmm. it, up until the, to the end of Dr. Moss's piece. Thanks for asking that. Anybody else want to comment? Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Oh, I didn't give people a moment. Anybody? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this session, um, and I hope that we can do more sessions that um, engage us in this way. I think it's really helpful for us to kind of uh, engage our thoughts. It's great to get thoughts from scholars, but I think um, I think as a, we'll work on getting doing more like this. Um, next week is going to be very very special. So we are going to be doing a, a session called "Creating Joy During Advent," and so we will be. Um, you might recall last year that we had Dr. Lisa Allen and McLaren who wrote a, a book on the womanist theology, womanist, oh gosh, I, I'm i sorry, I can't remember the name of the book. But anyway, she's writing about womanist liturgy. And so she guided us through um, how we could, um, through Advent, um, engage scriptures in a way and engage worship in a way that, um, that reflects uh, uh, the womanist theology. And so we developed some things from that, including um, some, some dance, some poetry, some prayers, um, and some testimonies. And so we will be uh, presenting some of those and adding some additional things to that. And so you'll get an opportunity. Thank you so much, Janice. A Womanist Theology of Worship, Liturgy, Justice, and Communal Righteousness by Reverend Dr. Lisa Allen McLaren. Um, and so um, next week, uh, you'll please come because you might get an opportunity to participate yourself if you would like. Um, and I've already asked some of you, some of you I'm going to uh, be in touch with later to um, to be a part of of next week. But we do hope that all each of you will come back and join us, and that will conclude um, 
that'll be our last now session for this calendar year and then we'll take back up in january so i'm going to turn things back over to janice who was our host of the evening and i apologize for talking so much um hope you all have a great evening so if you'll join me in a word of prayer i can pray us out God, right now, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you are and for all that you've done. We just um, thank you for allowing us to gather here together. We pray that even as we go our separate ways, that we'll continue to reflect on what we've heard about Howard Thurman, continue to reflect on the words and meditations of Howard Thurman, um, especially as it relates to um, community. God, I pray that even now you'll just begin to lay people on our hearts who we may need to reach out to, those who we could give a private blessing to, um, those who we may need to be reconciled with, those who we may need to forgive. Um, we pray that you'll just lead us and guide us, especially as it relates to those who are in community, and in relationship with um, this holiday season. I pray that you bless um, everyone who joined tonight, everyone on this call, that you continue to be with us as we go throughout the rest of this week. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you all so much Amen. for being here. Amen. Have Amen. a great evening. Amen. 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 Good, Good night. evening. Good night. Be well. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good, night. Good, night. Good, night. Good to see you, Janelle.